Hi, Amy, how are you? Good, how are you doing, Alex? I'm very good. I'm excited for today's discussion. We are having a discussion with Henry Giroux. Um, we're very pleased to, to present this uh, to everyone today. It covers a number of interesting themes and topics in his work, um, neoliberalism, uh, crisis of historical memory. Um, what, what, what parts of this did you find particularly interesting, Amy? Well, I mean, I also think the way um, in which he discusses, right, about pub the responsibility, the moral responsibility of public intellectuals, right, and thinking through theory and pedagogy as making that accessible, especially in these times right now and looking forward to the future. Yeah, he, he, he's so strong on linking together the moral argumentation with the political, economic, and pedagogical analysis. Um, and that really does come through in this in this discussion. And it's something that I've always really appreciated about his work. So without further ado, uh, we introduce uh, our discussion with um, Dr. Henry Giroux. Hope you all enjoy it. Um, so welcome to Collective Intellectualities, a program where we explore issues related to education and educational theory within our world today. We are produced in conjunction with the Philosophy of Education Society of Australasia and their new digital venture, PISA Agora, and the journal Educational Philosophy and Theory. So remember to check out the links below for more information and be sure to click subscribe. I'm Amy Soho, a PhD candidate in the Department of Educational Foundations at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I'm Alex Means. I'm a graduate chair and associate professor in the Department of Educational Foundations at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And we're very excited today because we are joined by our guest, Dr. Henry Giroux, who currently holds the McMaster University Chair for Scholarship in the Public Interest in the English and Cultural Studies Department and is the Paulo Freire Distinguished Scholar in, cult in Critical Pedagogy. He is an internationally renowned writer and cultural critic who has authored or co-authored over 65 books, written several hundred scholarly articles, delivered more than 250 public lectures, been a regular contributor to print, television, and radio news media outlets, and is one of the most cited Canadian academics working in any area of humanities research. His latest book is American Nightmare, Facing the Challenges of Fascism Out on City Lights. Welcome, Henry. Thank you. By the way, that's not my latest book, but it's uh, not. Oh, what what is your latest book, Henry? My latest book is is called Race, Politics, and Pandemic Pedagogy, and it'll be out by Bloomsbury in uh, in January. And the book after American Nightmare is called The Terror of the Unforeseen, which is published by the Los Angeles Review of Books. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, so nobody reads these books. I have to mention them. So please. <laughs> Well, we no, have to no, correct it, so it's uh, like we, we have 67 we books out website. now. <laughs> so, um, excellent. So, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we, have a, we wanted to begin with a couple of questions about theory and the role of theory in your work. Um, over your career, your, your scholarly attention and focus has shifted over time. You have different phases in your work. The, the, the initial phase, um, you drew heavily on the Frankfurt School and Paulo Freire, and you made a big impact on what was then called the new sociology of education in the late 1970s. Um, as, as you move along, you go into a phase where you become much more engaged with questions of language, culture, power, identity, um, working in the, the areas of cultural studies. Um, and, and over the last 20 years or so, you've been um, a prominent writer on, on neoliberalism. And we're wondering if you could reflect a little bit on the role of theory in your work. There are strong continuities across all of these different phases in your work. Um, and I think one of those continuities is, is always your attentiveness to thinking about theory as pedagogy. And so if you could talk a little bit about the role of theory in your work over time, and also this relationship that you see between theory and pedagogy, or maybe even theory as a kind of pedagogy. I'm not sure if you would put it that way, but yes. No, I, I mean, I think theory is always a kind of pedagogy, because I think in, in some ways it's always grappling with enormously important questions about not only the production of knowledge, but how knowledge functions in terms of what it normalizes and what it legitimizes and what its consequences are, and also what knowledge means 
in terms of particular kinds of social relationships that offer the possibility of rethinking uh, how we might imagine what it means to teach, what it means to learn, and what it means to engage the public sphere, and what it means to expand the very notion of education itself outside of the spheres of schooling. But I, but I think for me, uh, the question of theory, of course, is always important because you, it's hard to imagine how you deal with pedagogical relations without a theory. Otherwise, you reduce pedagogical relations to questions of methods and questions of, uh, of, of positivism and questions of objectivity that undermine the very meaning of pedagogy as an emancipatory logic. But I, I think I've, I've always tried in my work to model myself in some ways after a kind of 19th century version of what it means to be an intellectual. And, I, and I, I'm sure I haven't been that successful, but I, w w what that means is that I, I think that as an intellectual, you've got to be like Edward Said. You have to be a traveler. You, know, you can't allow, you have to cross boundaries. I mean, you have to understand politics as a comprehensive, as opposed to an utterly siloed and isolated kind of endeavor. And you've got to recognize that theory, like politics itself, can never remove itself, not only from material conditions of power, and the social institutions that impact that they're impacted by, but also from the, the, the issues that are defining a particular historical moment. So I, 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 I went out of my way and told myself very early in my journey that I, I wasn't going to repeat myself. I mean, I wasn't going to, like some theorists in education who just write the same thing, have written the same thing for the last 50 years, you know, same issues. I mean, and they seem detached from any understanding of how power mutates, of how issues change, uh, of how, and, and also not change in terms of issues that are utterly important that represent a new form of absence, a kind of disappearance. I mean, for instance, when I was working with cultural studies in that field, when, when cultural studies was really raging, uh, you know, there were very few people who were talking about pedagogy. And uh, I, I mean, even to the point, except the Stuart, Stuart Hall did, but even, I mean, I mean, and Larry Grossberg was very interested in the issue, but they even put out a reader of important terms, I think somewhere in the 80s, and they didn't put pedagogy in the book. And I remember writing to Larry and saying, is this for real? How can you do this? You know, we've been talking about this for five years now. And oh, the other people didn't think it was worth doing. So for me, it was always a matter of reminding them and reminding a number of other people that pedagogy is crucial, that education is central to politics, and that politics changes. And so there was a movement from, of course, uh, theory and resistance and questions of education to questions of cultural studies, the questions of what it meant to be a border crosser, the questions of taking on youth, questions of what it means to rethink the notion of public intellectuals, to the question of neoliberalism, and, and of course, then now my, my more recent work. So I, I always felt that I, I had to, I had to learn more and more and redirect and recontextualize my theoretical background, drawing from a number of people uh, in ways that were relevant to the times in which I found myself, and to be able to predict issues that often were not being talked about. I mean, I, I was talking about neoliberalism when Bourdieu was, you know. Mm -hmm. and now, of course, everybody talks about neoliberalism, but I, I mean, well, you know, I was talking about neoliberalism and authoritarianism 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think they're talking, how about now, do you think that they're talking about pedagogy more or less, or is it in different ways? I, you know, I, I, I think, that, you know, I think that pedagogy is certainly taken off as a field, and, and uh, I, I don't think it has the theoretical um, sophistication that it had in the 1980s and 90s, to be honest. I mean, I think people like Alex, I think people like Ken, uh, uh, enormous exceptions, enormous, and, and Alex's work is brilliant. Uh, but 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 I but I do think that uh, there's been a watering down, a thinning out of of how pedagogy is talked about, particularly in terms of its historical roots. Amy, I mean, I I, I see people writing about pedagogy in ways that seems to suggest that what they're talking about never happened before they started talking about. It. <laughs> And, and uh, I, I'm always kind of amazed by that, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I don't see, I, I see very few things that in some way match the sophistication of the 80s, to be honest. Although I know there's new work going on, and I may not be just keeping up with it, honestly, in the way that I should. Uh, but I'm, 
I'm really moved uh, by the work that I see, you know. Um, how, how do you account for that, a kind of thinning out, uh, as you put it, of um, sort of the creative and innovative theoretical work on pedagogy that took place during that time period and its, se its seeming absence today? I think there are three reasons for that. I think that first of all, the, when I was writing in the 1980s, along with a number of other intellectuals, uh, we all had tenure. And uh, neoliberalism has, hadn't come down with the full force of its scourge in purging, uh, purging academics from the academy and punishing them for what they believed in. I mean, you know, at, at that time, 70% of the labor force was uh, tenured or, or had a, uh, a permanent track. Uh, now, 70% of them, as you well know, Alex, are casual labor. Right. Secondly, I think there's, there's outside of the purging of academics and the increasing powerlessness, I think in some way there's, there's been a, a, a kind of uh, retreat on the part of the academy in, into, into issues that uh, seem to suggest that, A, you can talk about things that nobody else understands and that somehow will get you rewarded. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of paralyzing uh, obtusism that now has reemerged in the academy and also a kind of anti-intellectualism in some ways, but certainly a move away from the political sphere. I mean, I find it interesting that at, at a moment when uh, a, a country like the United States is on the verge of tyranny, uh, the educators who seem to be the most active are in high schools. <laughs> you know, rather than, they're the ones going on strike, you know, rather than those tenured professors basically who have some power and have the ability uh, it, it, it seems to me to to talk about issues that uh, you know that that often appear unspeakable, you know, that appear to be uh, beyond the bounds of uh, established discourse. So I, I, I and I also think that we now live in a, a different culture. It's a culture of immediacy. Nobody reads. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. nobody wants to read books. I mean, everybody wants to you know read five page articles, right? Uh, so I, I, I think there's that. And I also think that we've moved into a period in which two things have happened that are interesting. I mean, at one level, the various forms of oppression that have, have been made visible in the last 20 years are enormously important in understanding how domination works in multiple ways. But at the same time, it's caused a kind of sclerosis uh, in, in a form of often on identity politics that can't seem to find a way to get out of its own particular niche in order to build a more comprehensive understanding of politics where we can look at how these different identities share something that needs to unite them while at the same time not obliterating their own specific concerns. That fracturing has been very dangerous for the left, it seems to me, very disabling in many ways. It has its benefits, but I think the losses are really quite, quite significant. Yeah, I mean, in a culture where people don't have avenues and spheres through which they can, as, as you've put it many times, and, and C. Wright Mills put it, translate their own personal problems and private suffering into collective issues and public problems, there's a retreat, I, I think, a retreat into identity, um, or, 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 or within retreat into forms of, of ideas of, of certainty, like seeking out forms of certainty, and maybe identity being one of them. Um, and I always, you know, I, I took classes with you as a student. And one of the things that um, I, I found so valuable was your specific way of conceptualizing theory and identity. And could you, could you maybe talk a little bit about that in terms of contemporary struggles over identity and also in relation perhaps to broader social movements as well, how that articulates? Sure. <laughs> It's a, it's a question, the complexity of which might exceed my intelligence. <laughs> but but let, me, let me try to deal with some of that. You know, you, you said something a minute ago that I should have said earlier with respect to the previous question that bears down on this question. And that is one of the great tragedies in the rise of hegemonic ideology since the 1980s has been the, the uh, disconnection, has been disconnecting private issues from larger uh, systemic considerations. That mode of privatization is a form of depoliticization. And it, and it seems to me the question of depoliticization is as crucial as any notion of politicization, which you can't, you can't hook, unhook one, one from the other. I mean, in an age when it seems to me that all problems are seen as individual problems, 
and there's no understanding of how to basically conceptualize the social. Uh, that has to be one of the most powerful ideologies for domination that has come along in 400 years because it isolates people, it, it uh, removes them from larger social context, it leads them to believe that they're responsible for every issue that they face, and it produces enormous forms of resentment in which easy answers seem appealing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about races, it's about blacks, it's about immigrants, you know, we need a strong man. I mean, it, it's basically the building blocks for fascism. It is really one of the most powerful building blocks for, 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 for fascists because it doesn't really create a space for creative thinking and intellectual engagement, engagement and social engagement. And I, and I think that, you know, for me, you know, you, you have to make these discourses visible. I mean, I, I, I remember recently I was watching a, a film on Arthur Miller, you know, and he, and he says something like, he says, you, you have to speak the unspeakable and the closer you get to it, the more real it is because it's part of making life possible for those who come after you. You know, it, it's, it, it's a way of uh, not only uh, illuminating ideas, but offering alternative narratives that, that re allow people to reclaim their own sense of agency. And it seems to me around this question of identity, you know, drawing from these two moments that I, I tried to articulate, not very clearly, one is the inability of privatization that takes place, which prevents people from translating private issues into public issues, and the notion that everybody's responsible for their own problems. It, 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 it seems to me the, the next question that emerges here is how do we begin to talk about identity in terms of the struggle over agency? Not just the struggle over particular civil and, and, and political rights, but the struggle over agency itself, the struggle over identities. I mean, the struggle over values, the struggle over social relations, that's the central question for me around a politics of identity. And that is with unequivocally a pedagogical issue. That issue makes pedagogy absolutely central to politics. Because it seems to me that every kid that walks into a classroom, every viewer who puts on Fox News, you know, everybody who basically picks up a book that has a narrative that all of a sudden is saying, I'm speaking to you. It's about what we call, what Stuart Hall called, the politics of identification. And if we don't have a politics of identification in which people can recognize themselves in the narratives that we provide, and if those narratives don't in some way speak to them in ways that allow them to shift the very nature of their consciousness, we failed. We have failed as intellectuals, and we have failed as academics, and we have failed as public intellectuals. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that's a tall order, but it seems to me that when you have 74 million people supporting a guy who basically has killed over 240 million, 40,000 people in the United States, you have to begin to ask yourself, what kind of stories are afoot here in what sites, under what circumstances that are leading people to believe that they can support somebody who basically has placed their own lives and the lives of their children in danger. And, and I think part of, part of what you're getting at here, there's a couple of things. One, there's a need to think about education as part of a broader social process for the production of subjectivity, forms of agency, and forms of identification. And then part of that also, to come back to the, I, the, the notion of intellectuals and their responsibility, a need to rethink and reframe what an educator is. And I'm wondering, also bringing back those notions of theory, making theory accessible, how do you, how do you, sort, of, how do you sort of connect up a need to think about education as a broader social process, the responsibilities of intellectuals, and then the role of theory and, and, the, and, and the notion of an intellectual as a, or, or an educator as a transformative intellectual. Well, I, I mean, if you, if you begin with the presupposition that education is about the production of subjects and that it's never removed from either particular institutions or material relations of power, you've already got something in play here that begins to suggest uh, that that struggle takes place in multiple sites and on, and on multiple levels. Uh, so it, it seems to me that connection is one connection. Secondly, you know, what are the theoretical resources that we want to use to begin to excavate that question? 
I mean, do we want to rethink the notion of culture as being intimately connected with social relations? Do we want to try to understand how culture is related to power? Do we want to go back and sort of move beyond the economistic readings of Marx that we get from people like Gramsci, from people like Raymond Williams, Edward Said, Stanley Aronowitz, uh, you know, Ellen Willis, it goes on and on. I mean, I mean, it seems to me that that theoretical uh, tradition, while it, it certainly has become more popular, in it, to say the very least, in the last two decades, still has not risen to the occasion of being able to understand that the center to the meaning of culture is really the struggle over forms of identity identifications and subject positions. And, and that, and you know, and what it means for public for public intellectuals to engage in that, along with social movements, not just as isolated intellectuals, right? Uh, you know, how do we begin to talk about what we do, not only in terms of producing ideas? I mean, you know, who was it who who recently said? He said, "Oh, our point is not to uh, give answers, but to uh, raise questions." Well, you know, I don't know about that. You know, I, I I don't even know if I take seriously what Mark said when he said the point is not to interpret the world, but but to change it. Actually, I don't understand how you change the world if you can't understand it. So it, it, it seems to me that you know we, we need to rethink that connection between culture, between shaping consciousness, and matters of institutions and power, and how that plays out educationally in a whole range of ways. Mm -hmm. I'm and wondering. I, and I think it, it it means we need to rethink certain traditions and theory that have been neglected uh, as a result of that. Yeah, and like how you said, neglected and watered down and streamlined, and then it also becomes just with the privatization of the individual, where if you don't see, like, it's making those connections not seen. And also, how do you communicate those connections? And so I, I always think about this, too. So I really love this question about making the responsibility, right, of an intellectual to make theory more accessible. And maybe there's even a, a difficult thing now. It's like, actually, um, communicating the relevance of theory in a time when everything's so fast, right? You have people, how you said, people don't want to read. Also, there's not really, sometimes they say there's no time to read, right? There's the luxury of time isn't there. So I'm wondering, like, is there, like, one, is there um, a creativity problem, but also is there, like, a translation um, component with it, with theory, and trying to make that accessible to the, to a broader public audience? I mean, I think there are a number of issues. I, I mean, I, I think that certainly in a time of massive anti-intellectualism supported by uh, corporate-based media, uh, this, this becomes a problem, right? I, I mean, it, the very notion of thinking becomes dangerous. And those, those people who really are on the cutting edge and risking their lives uh, uh, with the kind of civic courage that's, that's necessary to do that uh, often pay a terrible price, whether you're in academia or whether you're a journalist. Just think about Khashoggi uh, uh, and what's happening in Turkey and what's happening in a number of states now that have moved extremely to the right from Egypt to Turkey to Hungary. But I, but I, I, I think that the, the other issue here is that, you know, we're really talking about the collapse of civic culture. That's what we're really talking about. This is not just about anti-intellectualism. It's not just about the culture of immediacy. All those things are absolutely important because they point to a new kind of relationship between power, uh, new cultural technologies, and everyday life. And I, and I think that formation is new. It's very distinctive in terms of the 21st century, and it needs to be explored in great detail. Google is a great teacher. I mean, not just the universities, right? Uh, but, I, but I think this question of the collapse of civic institutions, and along with it, the collapse of civic culture, and along with it, the collapse of um, an emancipatory politics. You, you know, ideas matter, Amy, but they don't mean much if you don't have institutions to produce them and legitimate them. And I, and I think for those of us on the left, you know, we're kind of searching for those institutions that basically can uphold that, that demand. And, and for me, uh, you know, there are two ways to talk about this. I mean, at one level, which I've, I've talked about for a long time, and, and that is, one theory is you have one foot in and one foot out, right? I mean, you, you work in institutions that might be defined by, uh, by dominant codes, but you do your best to create spaces of resistance that are capable of producing more resistance. Secondly, you work outside the system, 
you know, you, you, you work and, you know, you write and you work in those places that offer alternative spaces that really can push at what, what we call the frontiers of the imagination, you know, and, and create new forms of language and so forth and so on. So it, 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 it seems to me that, um, you know, what, what we're seeing now in light of coming very specific, for a very specific answer to your question, you know, is we're seeing the rise of fascism. I, I mean, you know, we, we're in the midst of a fascist moment throughout the world uh, that's, that's being contested, of course, by young people, by indigenous groups and, and so forth and so on. But we've got to figure out how this fascism works in updated forms without simply relying on the assumption that if you don't mimic Hitler entirely, then you can't talk about fascism. I mean, it's just nonsense. It's just really nonsense. And, and, and I'm just shocked at academics who pursue this line. You know, I mean, as Iran said, as Sheldon Wolin, a whole range of people, uh, you know, fascism emerges in different forms. I want to try to understand the different forms that are now emerging, what, what they're doing to undermine any viable conception of radical democracy, and what that means for individuals and social movements to reimagine different forms of collective resistance. Yeah, it seems that the conversation around fascism, there's one camp that suggests that if it's not a fully blown totalitarian structure, then you can't talk about it. It's not really fascism. And then there's a group of people like you who draw on the tradition of the Frankfurt School and Hannah Arendt, who talk about it as a kind of style of politics. Right. It's not, um, uh, that, that doesn't have to have like a totality of consistency. There are elements and tendencies and they're latent within modernity and within modern societies and even particularly not particularly, but, uh, but also liberal democratic societies. And we need to understand and, and analyze what those tendencies are. And I had, a, I, I had an interesting incident, uh, not incident, but um, we were reading your book, Border Crossings, in my class and the updated edition. And um, the, the last chapter now from the, at least the newest edition that I have was on, on Abu Ghraib. And this was just a week ago, Henry. And I was really uh, kind of taken aback by the number of students who said, one, I was in elementary school when that happened, or I, I was in junior high school when that happened, and, and it made me feel particularly old. But um, also simultaneously, they were making comments like, I, I never knew that occurred. I, I, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know that the Bush administration um, you know, had so much mendacity that they, that they, that they told, you know, told so many lies and all, and all of this sort of thing. So, what I'm getting at here is you've written extensively about historical memory and its collapse. And I'm wondering if you could talk about a little bit about that in relation to fascism and the fascist style of politics in the moment that we're in. I, first of all, I think it's a terrific divide that, uh, in terms of the categories you've created. I think it's exactly right. Uh, and I must say, I, I, I may be too harsh with this, but I think those people who fall into the second camp, Corey Robbins, oh my God. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think these people actually become complicit in fascism, because it seems to me that they do something that we're talking about right now. They actually turn their back on learning from history, and you know, I mean, there's something about learning from history that seems to scare intellectuals, uh, except when you can rewrite it in your own interest and make the claim that, for instance, Poland never participated in, uh, you know, in the genocide of of, 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 of Jews in, in Poland, which, as you know, they've just passed a law saying that's a crime if you bring that up. Um, but I, I think that historical memory is absolutely crucial. And, and I don't think there's ever been a time when it's become more crucial. I mean, this business of trying to learn from history in light of a fascism that's reproducing elements of the past, that should be alarming. I mean, alarming. I mean, when you talk about racial purity, <laughs> when you put kids in cages, you know, when you use the language of, of vermin, and, and dehumanization, when you create policies that suggest that uh, the Confederacy was ba basically the model for American democracy, I mean, to, to make the claim that there's nothing to learn from history about this is to blindside ourselves to the potential consequences of where, these lang where this language leads. Fascism begins with language. And then it moves on to basically killing intellectuals. And then it moves on to killing anybody who doesn't fall into the category of, pure, of ideological and political purity. I mean, my, my friend Zygmunt Bauman, 
before he died. I mean, God, he wrote a book on identity that would shock people today, you know, in which he said, look, he said, sorry, the language of identity as I read it, he said, the end point is Auschwitz, you know, and, and, and he was, you know, and he was on to something. And if you read that sentence today, without having any historical reference for what he's talking about, you don't get it. You think, this guy is a, is a fascist. I mean, he's saying identity, there aren't different identities. He's not saying that at all. He's saying that identity has a propensity to become scleretic. And when it does, it normalizes notions of exclusivity that basically mimic right-wing populism that mimics the logic of genocide in the end point, as an end point. And I agree with that. And I, I completely agree with that. And I, and I think that... Uh, you know, it's funny, the, the, the great theorist of the 20th century and the 19th century, I mean, people like Adorno, I, I mean, people like Horkheimer, I, I mean, Leo Lowenthal, Rosa Luxemburg, they couldn't imagine theory without historical consciousness. You know, they couldn't imagine, you know, and, and yet today, uh, as, as you said, you know, I, I mentioned John Lennon in my class, and they didn't know who he was <laughs> at Mac. John Lennon. That made me feel like a, I. I tell people I was born just after Lincoln died, and they believe that <laughs> because they have no sense of who Lincoln is. And, but you're right. It, it, I mean, I, I think as academics, we have an enormous responsibility to resurrect those histories that shed light on many of the problems that we're facing, and also to shed light on the way in which history gets distorted. And produces narratives that have no 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 resemblance to reality. Well, yeah, Adorno writes in that um, essay on education after Auschwitz that the greatest danger is is a reified consciousness, which is a consciousness yeah. blinded to its own historical conditionedness. And he also talks about the need for welcome back, Amy. The need for the need for education to transform itself into sociology. By which yeah. he means, and it's it's somewhat similar to C. Wright Mills, which is to locate the subject in history, to locate the production of consciousness as a historical event, as something that's produced within a totality of social forces. Um, and it seems to me that you know the crisis of historical memory, at least in relation to the crisis of education, is very much related to that kind of absence. Um, and, and perhaps you could talk a little bit more about the crisis of education, the crisis of historical memory as being linked in, in, in particularly in the U.S. context and in relation to this rise of, I, of, I mean, of, of the fascist of, culture. The crisis of historical memory, is, in terms of how it's related to the crisis of, of education, is, is in part about the crisis of time. And, and what I mean by that is that when you have institutions that are defined by simply the bottom line, the only thing they think about is short-term profits. They don't think about long-term considerations. They don't think about long-term investments. Historical memory becomes a, becomes a nuisance. Uh, thinking in complex ways becomes a nuisance. I mean, when basically you want to define people as either consumers or taxpayers and nothing more, and you remove from any notion of education what it means to view it as a democratic public sphere that in some way has to address questions of justice and the relationship, its relationship to the public good, uh, then, then the question of historical memory with it, it becomes dangerous because thinking becomes dangerous. But I, I, but I also think that the thing that I, I find in the current moment that we probably needs to, needs to be addressed is that one of the ways in which neoliberalism basically survives is, is by isolating issues and not allowing issues to be connected so that we say schools are failing. You know, the right, the right wing says schools are failing. What they don't say is they're being defunded. <laughs> what they don't say is that wealth and power are, are being mobilized to benefit the, the 1%. What they don't say is that the social state is collapsing and in its place is the punishing state, and almost, in which all social problems are now defined as criminal problems. You know, so it, 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 it seems to me without those connections, without that, as, as you say, you know, that historical sphere to sort of inform people, uh, the question of time no longer becomes contemplative. The question of time now becomes expedient. You know, it's linked to questions of efficiency. It's not linked to questions of thoughtfulness. I mean, I think Hannah Arendt was absolutely right when she said the essence of fascism is thoughtlessness. And she said all thinking is dangerous. And I, and I think C. Wright Mills 
had it right. See, right Mills almost more than anybody else. I mean, when when he when he talks in the sociological imagination about the foundations of what it means to be a public intellectual and engage, the first thing he talks about is historical memory. There's what historical consciousness. You know, he talks about making visible those things that are often invisible. I mean, he talks about compre a comprehensive kind of politics, and I think all those things increasingly are absent from from it seems to me the neoliberal university. I mean, the thing I find astounding in the classes I teach, I teach in an arts and science program, the best students in the university, undergraduates. I have one class a semester with them and they're brilliant. They're just brilliant. They can write, they can think, but they can't make connections. Mm -hmm. They can't make connections. You give them an isolated topic and you tell them to write about it and it, it could be published tomorrow making connections, they don't have it because they don't have the language. Mm -hmm. And I give them that language. And I, I must tell you, 99.9% .9 of them come out of that class saying, wow, I have completely reshaped how I think. Uh, I don't think this way anymore. I am putting things together. I'm saying things I never saw before. I mean, it's, 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 it's really retooling, if I may put it that way, their own possibility for a different sense of agency. I want to put on the stage a pedagogy that says, look, your agency can be more capacious. Its capacity can be more extensive. But for that to happen, you have to learn how to make connections. You have to bring things together. And historical consciousness is one of them. And you have to slow time down. You have to slow it down. You've got to find a way to slow it down, you know? It becomes so much more difficult when so many students today are just struggling to survive. You know, the number of students on college campuses who are food insecure during the pandemic, who are isolated and alone, who are, you know, don't know, you know, don't necessarily know where their next meal is going to come from, their housing is insecure. So those kinds of underlying material pressures put, put you know, put, put a lot of pressure on um, uh, more, even more of a return on investment mentality for families going through higher education. Just naming some of the pressures um, that work against what you're talking about, but also one thing about um, this generation that I, I think is notable in, um, in, in relation to what you're saying. I was just talking to Ken Saltman the other day, and he wants to do some popular culture criticism. And we were talking about the capacity of young people today to meme, to, to sort of, to sort of um, use irony to deconstruct images in the popular culture and all of this. But what is lacking is the, that ability to make those system, systematic connections between the political economy, the culture, subjectivity, um, et cetera, et cetera, to think about these things as the totality of intersecting um, forces that need to be reckoned with, reckoned with as a totality. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, I, I think that to go back, you know, there, there, there there are wars being waged in the culture today that we need specific, a, a different kind of language for, you know. And I, and I think that, uh, you know, one, you know, I, I've used this in the past, you, you probably have heard this, but I, and I've expanded it a bit, but you know, there's, there's, there's the hard war in which people basically are suffering from what I call the war on time, which means that war, time is a deprivation and not a luxury. And as a deprivation, it's difficult under the mantle of simply trying to survive to think about anything else uh, that that makes sense. You know, I, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I'm always concerned about leftists who shame people because they say, "Oh, working class people are stupid. They voted for Trump and all this bullshit." Or white privilege is they should think more about white privilege. Well, I must say, I don't know what it means to think about white white privilege when you you know you have to make a choice between food and uh, and medicine. Right. I mean, this is not to say that white privilege doesn't matter as a political construct, but let's put it in a context that basically allows us to understand when people can actually see that as a mode of identification that they can relate to. That's one issue. Then, of course, there's the commercial war. I mean, kids are endlessly commodified, endlessly commodified. Then there's the war of surveillance. You know, people are basically under surveillance all the time, and it's getting worse, as you know. And, and so it seems to me that all three of those wars are connected and have been intensified to, to neoliberalism, you know, as, as a, you know, as a political, economic, social, cultural construct. The, 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 the thing that I am most concerned about in light of what you said about popular culture 
which isn't something I don't write about the way I used to, but, but I, I'm, I'm always concerned about how a politics of aesthetics, even in its most radical moments, can begin to mimic a politics of vulgarity. And, and how it, it, it basically begins to lose sight in its sarcasm and its satire and its irony. Irony, because, yeah. Questions of power. Mm -hmm. It was questions of power. And, and I'm sorry, when power drops out of the aesthetic, when it drops out of the logic, I tend to step back, uh, to be honest, you know, because I, I, I don't just believe in transgression as a liberatory moment when in fact it's entirely limited to the question of aesthetics. I'm, 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 I'm just going back to this question of historical memory that you mentioned that, Alex, because it's so important. You know, I mean, I mean, what responsibility do we have to be moral witnesses for the dead? You know, not just future generations. I, I mean, do we have a responsibility to those people who basically were killed in concentration camps and in gulags and, you know, who are who the Chinese are now putting in, 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 in camps in, uh, in China because they're Muslims? I, I mean, how do we imagine not simply historical memory as an intellectual capacity, how do we imagine it as a political responsibility? How do we imagine it as a moral responsibility? How do we fit it into the, the concept of moral witnessing? You know, how do we merge it with a notion of transgression that both illuminates in the past, but at the same time holds it accountable for the present and the future? Yeah, that's what I really wanted to say. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's, that's crucial, the underlying, I mean, that's, that's one of the, that's one of the things that always comes through in your public talks and in your writing is your, your absolute moral clarity and courage and commitment. And where do you, where do you see that happening today? Where, where are the sources in which those kinds of energies are being articulated and organized? Oh, I, I, I mean, God, I, I mean, I think that I, I see it happening in a number of places that I think is very illuminating and very moving. I see it with the teachers who went on strike last, last year over questions of gun violence. I see it with the young people who walked out of their schools. I think the George Floyd movement was just amazing. Nothing like it, actually, almost in American history in terms of bringing black and white people together to sort of really talk about and protest in the midst of a pandemic, no less, systemic racism. Uh, I think the Black Lives Movement in, in its ways in which it's reaching beyond national borders to align itself with Palestinian youth, Egyptian youth. I mean, these are all very promising movements. I think that uh, to go back to maybe an issue that Amy had raised, I think the question, and, I, and I, I need, maybe I need to correct myself on this. Uh, I, I, think, I actually think the question of pedagogy, while maybe it's lacks some of the sophistication that, you know, who am I? to talk about this lacking of sophistication because I was part of a certain movement in the 80s. Uh, let, let, me re, re, let me correct that a bit. Uh, I was lucky, we had the opportunity, we did some things that I thought were important, but a lot of people now are, are taking a pedagogy in ways that are amplifying its political possibilities. You know, it's, it's, it's political trust. I mean, it's everywhere. You know, I, I'm getting, I have people writing to me from every part of the world talking about pedagogy. Think about Alex in the 1980s or 1990s. That was not true. That was just not happening, you know. Uh, and I, and I, I think that when Donald Trump claims that he wants to create political forms of education, mm -hmm. you know, that charge is basically about pedagogy. That's an attack on pedagogy. Because I, it seems to me that when you, when you begin to say, look, we can't, I mean, I, mean, I, I remember uh, Jeb Bush in Florida passed a law claiming that social science teachers in the high school could not teach history as interpretation. They could only teach it as facts. <laughs> that was actually a law. And, 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 it, and it seemed to me it resuscitates what Hannah Harant has, has been, had said all her life. You know, thinking is dangerous. And Foucault said thinking, he talked about dangerous thinking. Dangerous memories is his term, dangerous memories. And I think we have a, an obligation to resuscitate 
what it means to make trouble, you know, in Baldwin's sense, right? What it means to, to in, in some way, call into question those forms of into research and so forth and so on. We need to resuscitate the silent questions, the neglected connections. That, that should be one of the things that I would think as public intellectuals we should do. And I think that we have to accept the fact that the consequences for that are going to be severe. You're not going to get awards. You're going to get potentially fired. You're not going to get tenure. Uh, and maybe you will. But it does, it's not easy. You know, it's not easy. Uh, when I look at my career, my God, over the course of 40 years, I mean, denied tenure, salary, frozen, it goes on and on. And people say, well, would you do this over? Of course I would do it over. I wouldn't think for one minute of, of changing my, my, my way of being in the world. Why would I do that? Why, and why aren't people on, on the edge of saying, hey, look, you know, this is a, we have an obligation to future generations, not just existing generations. That's a long-term project. That's not, a, that's not something that we define our careers by. I hate that word careerism. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, unless you have a vocation, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of a long-term project, we're about to emerge. I mean, here in the next eight months, we'll emerge out of this pandemic, hopefully. The vaccines will be circulated. Um, we're going to have a Biden administration in the U.S., so we're going to move into a post-Trump world. So what, what, what emergent forms of political thinking, pedagogy, organization are necessary as we move into this sort of next historical period? And I, think, I, 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 Henry, let me just ask an attendant question so I don't have to, to go back and ask, ask it a second time. There's that question. And also, you know, people, social theorists, you know, have been talking for several years now about that we're in an interregnum, that neoliberalism is sort of evolving and mutating and changing. Some people might claim we're entering into a post neoliberal period. So on one hand, what kinds of new forms of political thinking, pedagogy, and organization we need for a post-Trump post-pandemic period that we're moving into. And I'd also like to get your questions on neoliberalism and the interregnum and how maybe these two things come together. I, 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 think, I, I think that this is a, a, a very dangerous time. I think that the elements of a unapologetic, updated fascism have uh, ascertained themselves in a way that we thought was impossible in many liberal democracies throughout the world. I think that when we, t I think that the great uh, fear that I have is that people will think that with the election of Biden, uh, the era of Trump is over, uh, and that you know they'll personalize Trump in ways to suggest that he was just silly and stupid, but somehow was able to uh, accumulate a certain degree of power. I mean, what Trumpism is about is a cancer in this in a democratic society that is that has a long life. And it's been going on since 1619, at least in the United States. And we need to figure out how that gets reproduced, what it means, what shape it's going to take in the future, and particularly more than anything else, how this puts into relief, high relief, the importance of education and changing consciousness. Because if this movement is matched by an overwhelming cascade of manufactured ignorance and depoliticizing forces, Trumpism is not going to disappear by any stretch of the imagination. It'll, it'll intensify, and the United States will become a full-fledged fascist country within four years. At the end of Biden's term, Trump, they'll be back, and they'll win. So that's very scary, the, the, to say the least. Uh, and I'm trying to think through that now in a piece I'm trying to write, I'm having some trouble, but I'm, what I'm trying to argue is that this Trumpism is a cultural politics that has a long history and we need to unravel it. And we need to unravel it by making education central to politics. Around the question of neoliberalism, I, I, I am just baffled by people who make the claim that we're in a post neoliberal period. I, I don't see any indication that the people whose power has been consolidated uh, in the interest of, of the, their financial interests and class consolidation, I don't see them going away at all. Uh, and anybody who thinks they are is absolutely insane. They don't go away, they just remutate. I mean, they're smart. 
They understand how ideas work. They understand how ideologies work. And they just update themselves. So I, I, it seems to me that when we talk about neoliberalism, first and foremost, we're not just talking about the pedagogical side of neoliberalism, which very few people talk about. You do, I do, but very few people talk about it. That has to be accentuated, whether it's the elevation of self-interest, privatization, commodification, deregulation, all those things. You know, um, the emphasis on moral individual responsibility. But I, but I think that the other side of this is that we, we need to be enormously concerned ab about how this notion of, of neoliberalism in its mutations, what forms it takes and how that can be, that can be made visible. And it can't happen unless we focus a, as a central concept on economic inequality. Economic inequality is the bedrock of neoliberalism. It's the bedrock. It destroys lives, it, dis it accumulates power in ruthless ways. It creates a culture of cruelty. And as it mutates, it no longer makes the claim that it's gonna provide social mobility, it, it, all the benefits of meritocracy. It's done with that stuff. It's failed and it knows it's failed. So it's suffering a legitimation crisis. And as a result of that legitimation crisis, it has retooled itself to now claim and, and it and, and align itself with fascist ideologies, particularly the notion of the logic of disposability, the question of racial purity, the question of blaming immigrants. So all of a sudden it's now created a new aesthetic, a new discourse, a new set of enemies, and it worked. And it worked. Let's be honest, it worked. 75 million people voted for Trump. That suggests to me it worked. You know, whether we can fight that uh, and, and is, is really the question of the 21st century. Yeah, especially when you're talking about neoliberalism, but also um, that with economic inequalities and just the es escalating economic inequalities, one of the, also the prevailing questions that's emerging and really concerning is just the, um, the intensification of, of a climate crisis. And so you know, everyone says, how, oh, people are like, oh, we want to return to normal, but we don't want to return to what was the previous normal because that's just global capitalism that doesn't value, you know, people, right, people and their agency. But we're, as some of the questions that are also emerging from this is that, you know, they want to go back to business as usual, but that is just, that's exhausting the ecology of the planet. And this is also, I think, with a lot of youth, right, they're very adamant about the climate crisis and um, thinking of ways to teach about climate change. So we're thinking that, um, as we come out of the pandemic and with the Anthropocene that's going to dominate social aspects of our life, but also how might we, re, you know, resist returning to that sense of normalcy, normalcy, and then also daring to imagine and creating a world that's more sustainable, just, and equitable? I, I think one of the things we need to do is to prioritize the crisis that we face. And it seems to me the ecological crisis is probably the worst crisis, without, without doubt in my mind. I, I'm with Noam Chomsky on this. I mean, I, I think there are three crises that we need to address that are right at the top of the list. One is the threat of nuclear war, the other is the ecological crisis, and the other is the radical attack that's taking place all over the world on democracy. And it seems to me the ecological crisis brings together all kinds of movements that can link uh, what I would call the, the, the mega narrative for the left. And the mega narrative for the left is capitalism and democracy are not the same thing. And that capitalism is the big discourse of social and political death. And uh, we need to talk about democratic socialism. And we need to make at the heart of that socialism what it means to not only respect human life uh, and, and to you know, uh, uh, think about the future in terms of very different notions of production. Uh, but we, we need to think about saving the planet because the planet is about to die. I mean, he, Chomsky's right when he claims, as many people do, that uh, you know, the, the, the word that we need to make foremost in our minds right now is extinction. We're talking about a politics of extinction. We're not, we're not just talking about more young kids suffering from asthma. <laughs> we're not just talking about more irritants, pollutants in the air. We're talking about extinction. We're talking about the extinction of the human race. And I, and I, and I, I say that not to, to overly dramatize uh, the nature of the problem, though it needs to be overly dramatized. I say that because I think we need to recognize how ruthless capitalism is. Remember, 
This is a system that separates economic cost, I'm sorry, economic activity from social cost. All totalitarian governments do this. They separate their activities from social consequences. That's what they do. But capitalism has built it into a religion. It's a religion. It's, it's, it's a theocratic religion. And it affects every aspect of our agency. It makes us more self-interested, less compassionate. We don't care about things outside of our own concerns. We, uh, we don't believe in solidarity. We believe in a war of all against all. We operate as if we're in a reality TV program. There's only one person left on the island. Oh, my God. I mean, it goes on and on. And, and, and it seems to me that that logic is so antithetical to any compassionate, humane conception of the planet, which is just there to be exploited. Annihilation rests on the notion of exploitation. Exploitation, when it's intensified, rests on the notion of the concentration of power and, and finance in the hands of relatively few people. And so we need to unravel those connections. Yeah, and I like how you actually said, because I think, it, you know, in the beginning of the conversation when we were talking about theory, but also um, imagination, and you said creating a narrative, like, right, we need new narratives to align ourselves with. And something also to you're saying, and this calls back to maybe a previous interview, um, I'm just thinking about when I teach students about climate change, right? At first, like, why are we learning about this in education? And I'm like, well, it's a problem and you're going to have to teach ways of making it relevant because yeah, the planet's dying. It's going to die and it's a direct result of just unhinged, unfettered capitalism. Um, and when I talk to students about this, they're angry. You know, they're angry about a lot of things. They're just, they're just continuously in these intensification of various crises, economic, ecological, you know, democratic. Um, I like what you said before, you, you said one of the things is we have to learn how to mobilize that rage and that, that that's actually an educational problem. You know, I, I think that when you talk about this is the first generation in, in terms of its expansiveness um, that has not only been canceled out of democracy, it's been canceled out of the future. And, and, and it seems to me that young people know that. How, wh where do you continually draw inspiration and strength, and how do you not give in to despair? I draw inspiration and strength from the human suffering that I see all around me that horrifies me. And, and, and it seems to me that uh, I, I just can't allow myself to be in a world and not be able to address that, you know, even in the small way that I do. I'm just a writer, you know, I'm just a, you know, I'm, who am I? But, I, but at some level, uh, I'm a working class kid that should have gone to prison, you know, I mean, I, but I, but I think at some level, you know, I, I, you know, you have to be in the world. You have to, you have to sort of a, you know, take a responsibility, take some responsibility for what it means to be in that world. And I think that I was lucky, you know, I, I grew up surrounded by intellectuals that changed my life. You know, I, I lived next to Brown university for a while and I used to go to lectures there and, uh, and I couldn't understand a word uh, that these people were saying. <laughs> and I really didn't, you know. And then one day Stanley Aronowitz came in, got on the stage and, oh my God. I mean, he was like full of passion and energy. And I understood every word. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, it, uh, it, 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 and I, I saw a number of people like, I, I met Howard Zinn. I was friend with Zygmunt Bauman. I met Paulo Freire. I mean, these people for me became models of courage. You know, they touch your life. You know, we need models. You know, we need people that people can look to and say, wow, you know, if you can do this, they can do it. Why can't everybody has the capacity to be involved? Everybody has the capacity to, it seems to me, keep going. But I, I guess ultimately the question I have to face is what would it mean if I didn't care anymore? And then it means I've become complicit with the very order I hate, right? I don't know. I, I, I don't view myself as a masochist, you know? <laughs> that's, that's excellent, Henry. We, we so appreciate your time today and, and so enjoyed talking to you. So, so thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, thank you Amy. Thank you. Good luck with your dissertation. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Alan.